Good afternoon uh, to everyone um, who is joining us today. I'm uh, Maria Logan. I'm the trustee of the UK Foundation, The Future of Russia. I'm very honored to present today this um, great report, uh, Global Strategy 2022, Swording Kremlin Aggression Today for Constructive Relations Tomorrow. This is the work of several years by an outstanding team of Russian experts at the Atlantic Council. The Future of Russia Foundation that I represent here today is honored to be part of this collaborative effort. In 2019, we met with the Atlantic Council team to brainstorm how our foundation can support a development of a new Russia policy in Washington and beyond, a policy that can not only provide a short-term strategy of dealing with Putin's Russia, but also lay out a vision for a longer-term cooperative relationship with a different rule of law based post-Putin Russia. Because if you can imagine it and you visualize it, you can create it. Today, it is more than ever difficult to imagine this post-Putin Russia. Putin used the joint press conference with President Macron yesterday to warn of nuclear conflict. He said, and I quote, I want to stress it one more time I've been saying it, but I very much want you to finally hear me and to deliver it to your audience in print, TV, and online. Do you understand it or not that if Ukraine joins NATO and attempts to bring Crimea back by military means, the European countries will be automatically pulled into a war conflict with Russia? Question mark. Putin recognized Moscow military power is incomparable with that of NATO but warned his country is still one of the, in quote, leading nuclear states. There will be no winners and you will be pulled into this conflict against your will, he added. You won't even have time to blink your eye when you execute Article 5. I'm extremely glad that despite the present circumstances in which this report is being launched, the authors were able to include the vision of post-Putin Russia and provide some specific recommendations as part of its longer term goal. Describe, and I quote from the report, describe in clear terms the cooperative relationship that would emerge with the prosperous, powerful Russia that plays a constructive role in this rules-based international order. While this is a long-term objective, it should immediately be enshrined in US policy." End of quote. I also applaud the effort by the team of authors to differentiate throughout the report between Russia and Russian people and Putin's Russia or Kremlin driven policies. Contrary to what Putin thinks, Russia doesn't equal Putin. The threat to the world's order and freedom doesn't come from the Russian people. Russian people do not want the war. Under the influence of very successful Kremlin's propaganda machine, many in Russia today mistakenly believe that the West is the aggressor and may see Putin as a defender of Russian interests. More than ever, US and Europe leaders need to reach out to Russian people and engage with Russian civil society. Many activists and freedom fighters left Russia yes, uh, last year because of threat of political prosecution and closure of many NGOs due to the new repressive laws on foreign agents and undesirable organizations. But these brave freedom fighters are among us today and are ready to continue the dialogue which provides a path to this new cooperative approach with future of Russia. I now turn to Damon Wilson, who was part of that 2019 brainstorming and I'm so glad that he could um, provide a forward for this report. And I turn to you, Damon. Thank you. Maria, thank you so much. It is an honor to be back at the Atlantic Council and especially for this important conversation. I'm especially pleased to follow you, Maria, someone who has done so much to support a better future for Russians. And you're right, I'm back in part because several years ago, it was sort of your creativity and helping to think about envisioning a post-Putin Russia and how to help imagine what that looks like. And I think that's a powerful exercise. So we're gathered today, not just for the launch of an important strategy paper on Russia, but I think to tap this extraordinary brain trust the council has lined up that you'll hear from on how to support Ukraine in defending its ability to de determine its own future. And in doing so, how to put relations with the people of Russia on a better footing as well. 
So I'm, I'm rereading a book by Ned board member and uh, author Ann Applebaum, Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine. It is, of course, about the whole of the more, the great famine that killed millions of Ukrainians in 1930, 1932 and 33. And the book begins with the, the, the simple sentence, the warning signs were ample. Those words resonate today. The warning signs are ample. So while Putin threatens to follow Stalin in his approach to Ukraine, he's lost sight of the fact that despite efforts to repress, even deny Ukrainian identity, he thrives. Whether surviving the Great Famine or the 92% of the electorate voting overwhelmingly for an independent Ukraine in 1992, whether the Great Mobilization overturning a stolen election in the Orange Revolution or the Euromaidan protests and the Revolution of Dignity or mobilizing people in support of their nation in the wake of Crimea's annexation and the invasion of Donbass. The Ukrainian people have shown the world that they have a say in their own future, often whether others like it or not. So in this crisis, we can count on Ukrainians to play their role. The question for our speakers today is how does a democratic West best play its role? So this conversation is about how a long-term strategic approach coming out of this strategy drive in the scope crossing to the Atlantic Council can inform choices today at a critical juncture that will shape the world we live in, underscoring the stakes. So the core of this report is that by thwarting Kremlin aggression today, we pave the way for pursuing constructive relations with Russia tomorrow. So I opened my forward to this report recalling the last time Beijing hosted an Olympics in August 2008, during which Russia invaded Georgia. There's an eerie echo of 2008 as Beijing hosts the Winter Olympics, and we see the world's leading autocrats coming together, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, as they work together to undermine democracy at home and abroad, and essentially to reshape a world to make it safe for autocracy. And that's what's at stake. And I think this time policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic, they've learned a bit. Indeed, there's a long history of debate among policymakers about the best strategy for Russia. And it's often characterized among those considered hawks and those considered soft on Russia, but that's a little lazy intellectually. And I think this effort by, led by Ambassador John Herbst and this top flight group of co-authors, it bridges that divide by underscoring that the tough approach now in Ukraine is the best approach to a more constructive Russia in the future. So indeed, as we put the people of Ukraine front and center in our considerations, how can we pursue a policy that also puts the people of Russia who deserve so much better front and center? And this report makes an important contribution to getting this right. And I welcome many of the specific ideas, but I wanna close by adding just three elements that I see as critical to success. First, it is people, civil society in particular. It's their mobilization that will be among the most effective means to deter criminal aggression. And we need to keep them and our support for them front and center in any long-term strategy. After all, it's their determination and ingenuity along with the, our long track record of support that's made civil society one of the success stories of Ukraine's uneven democratic record. And this is more, this is more than, than no decision about Ukraine without Ukraine, the mantra of US policy, but rather it's about embracing the fact that Ukrainians have a say in determining their future. Second, given Putin's track record, deterrence today may require more than even the strong responses to Russian aggression proposed in this report. It may require creative thinking and policies to disrupt Vladimir Putin's Russia, increasing the cost of his actions to date rather than waiting for escalation. We're in the middle of a hybrid war already. Third, the message of our commitment to stand by the Russian people, it has to remain front and center as coverage li likes to boil this down to Russia versus Ukraine, or more likely Russia versus the United States. And outreach to the Russian people now is key to laying the groundwork for a future, more constructive relationship, relationship with a Russia that will respect the rule of law. And I think as, as we turn this over for the conversation, it's important to remind as I talk to my friends and family members who aren't experts, just to help underscore that today's crisis is an entirely fabricated one. As Putin recognizes that if freedom and democracy succeed in Ukraine or Georgia or Belarus, that if they follow the wildly successful path of the Baltic states or Poland, it's only a matter of time until the Russian people demand more for themselves. So today's conflict is therefore also about power inside Russia. 
where confrontation with the West in some respects is helping Putin control and consolidate control at home. It's not Ukraine, it's not NATO that threatens Russia. Rather, Putin fears people, including his own people. So he's thrust the world into this, his latest crisis. As, he, as we go through his contortions, we must avoid our own contorted efforts to meet his demands, echoing the action of democracies in the 1930s, which led to disaster. Rather, democracies today must meet this moment with democratic unity and, and strength, and with solidarity with Ukraine as a nation, and solidarity with the people of Russia who deserve so much better. And with that, over to you, Melinda. Thanks, Damon. It's great to have you back on our platform. Thanks for writing the forward. Huge thanks to Maria Logan and the foundation for their support. We could not have done this without you. And I want to give a big shout out to my colleague, Doug Klain, who shepherded this report throughout the entire process. And congratulations to Ambassador John Herbst, who is the lead writer on this report. Very well done. We look forward to jumping into it. Folks, we have an hour today, and I have Ambassador John Herbst, I have Evelyn Farkas, Vladimir Mila from Russia, and Steve Began here to discuss the paper. At the top, I'm going to give Ambassador Herbst 10 minutes to discuss the paper, and then we're going to have a discussion, and we'd love to have you participate. If you're on Twitter, you can send us a question, or you can use uh, the Q&A function below. Ambassador Herbst, again, congratulations on this great paper. Could you please give us uh, a, a summary and, and your top-line judgments, and then we'll jump into a conversation. The floor is yours. Okay, Melinda, thank you very much. First, I need to thank all those who made this paper possible. Um, the structure and vision of the paper is mine, but the depth and richness of the analysis, the specific recommendations would not have been possible without my co-authors, Anders Aslan, David Kramer, Sandy Verschbaum, and Brian Whitmore, but also colleagues who contributed readily to this. Um, General Phil Breedlove, Ambassador Steve Pfeiffer, Ambassador Dan Freed, General Ben Hodges, and Franklin D. Kramer. Also, Melinda, you and Doug have been critical, Doug Klain have been critical to get this report out in a timely fashion. My Scowcroft colleagues, Barry Pavel and Matt Kronig, who on the strategy paper series have also been critical to this process. And of course, the AC leadership, Fred Kemp and Damon when he was the v executive VP. Um, finally, our sponsors, um, the generosity of the Future of Russia Foundation with Maria Logan as the chief idea person, absolutely critical for this event as well as Dr. Alexander Mirchev, who sponsors the overall Skullcroft Center strategy series. Okay, those are my thank yous. Now, what's at stake? To understand the recommendations we make, the strategy we recommend, you have to understand what's at stake and what the background is. This, the background is this, the international institutions that the US helped establish after World War II and then helped refurbish at the end of the Cold War have led to an unprecedented period of peace, stability, prosperity in global history. Absolutely unprecedented. Since 1945, there have been no great power wars in Europe or anywhere else. The institutions we built are the reason for that. And great power wars are the great destroyer of lives and of wealth. Extreme poverty around the world encompassed 63% of the global population in 1950. In 1990, when the Cold War ended, 36% of the world's population was in extreme poverty. In 2015, that dropped to 10%. That's the result of these institutions, which again, we played a major role in creating. We have therefore a vital interest in the maintenance of this order. Our prosperity, American prosperity and security depend upon it. The United States was involved in two great power wars in the last century. Again, no such wars in the last 65 years. There are now two large powers, China and Russia, that are challenging the system. While China is the greater threat because it has a real, a powerful economy, Russia under President Putin poses the more direct challenge, the more aggressive policies to this order. And he, of course, or rather Russia, of course, is a nuclear power peer of the United States. We have a vital interest in thwarting this Moscow threat to the order, and that today we're gonna to discuss how. So let's talk a little bit about the Russia challenge. And this comes back to one of the, one of the points of our paper. By the laws of geopolitics, 
the United States and Russia need not be foes. Yes, Russia is a great power, as are we, but we are distant powers. Yes, we, we almost touch across the Straits and the Bering Sea, but the real, the real um, centers of American and Russian life, geography, are many thousands of miles distant. For most of American Russian history, we were not rivals, not adversaries, not rivals. Only after Russia was captured by a dangerous and messianic ideology, Marxism or communism, did we become adversaries. At the end of the Cold War, we appear to have overcome that. And for 15, 10 or 15 years after that, our relations, Washington's relationships, relationship with Moscow was complicated, but not adversarial. That changed as President Putin consolidated his power. Remember, Putin considers the fall of the Soviet Union the greatest tragedy of the bloody 20th century. And he began to pursue an openly revisionist foreign policy, certainly by 2007. His famous or infamous Munich Security Council speech in February of that year, his massive cyber attack on Estonia that summer, his war against Georgia in 2008, his seizure of Crimea in 2014, and his so-called, excuse me, his not quite covert war in Donbass, which began what a few weeks after Moscow seized Crimea. Putin combined this policy, this aggressive foreign policy, with a policy of increasing repression at home and widespread corruption. Since 2012, when oil was still $100 a barrel, this has led to economic stagnation in Russia. There has been little growth in Russian economy since 2012, in other words, a decade, and living standards in Russia have plummeted. Today, the people in Russia openly speak of a second period of zastoy or stagnation, like the one in the 1980s that preceded the fall of the Soviet Union. This is a challenge we face today. The world's largest country with a declining population and a large but stagnant economy based principally on raw materials is challenging the international order. Yes, it is a peer nuclear power with either the second or the third most powerful conventional military. What do we do? Our policy is based on the understanding that the key to maintaining great power status is a strong economy. And in today's world, this means an economy that empowers its people to create and enjoy the fruits of their own creativity. Power and status will naturally accrue to countries that do that. And countries that do that do not need provocation and war to enhance their international position. Manifestly, Moscow, or rather Russia under Putin is not one of those countries. Someday, the rulers of Russia will understand this and adjust their domestic and foreign policies. It would be wonderful if this happened under President Putin, but we must establish our own policies that manage the Kremlin challenge today until that wonderful day arrives. And it will arise, it will come, because unless Russia makes these adjustments, it will not be able to maintain great power status for decades to come. And when this day comes, the natural order of geopolitics will kick in and distant powers like Russia and the United States will have no reason to be rivals. The point is that we have no quarrel with the people of Russia, none. We propose a four part policy geared to protect our interests in the short and middle term against a powerful adversary whose economy will continue to fall behind over time. While seeking to create the conditions for future cooperation once Moscow understands that its revisionist designs are as bad for Russia as for the international community. The basis for a successful policy is to work with allies and partners to counter the immediate danger from Moscow. That is the first pillar of our four-part policy. This is the Swasan qua non for successful Russia policy. Previous administrations had fooled themselves and wasted our time with a reset of various types. The Biden team has come up with the fanciful notion that we could somehow park our relationship with Moscow and establish, quote unquote, stable and predictable relations with a serial provocateur. In practical terms, this first element of our strategy means bolstering NATO's northeastern flank, beefing up a NATO presence, a naval presence in the Black Sea, and backing democracy movements from Belarus to Venezuela, and including in Russia. Equally important, 
the United States needs to stay on the same page with Europe and present the United Front on sanctions, force posture within NATO, and diplomacy. But the U.S. must do this today as it did it during the Cold War, not by catering to the weakest policy instincts on the continent, but by persuading its allies and partners to adopt the strong but necessary policies that serve the interests of all in the transatlantic community. The ongoing crisis created by Putin's threat to launch a new invasion of Ukraine has shown how difficult but crucial this is. The second element of our policy follows directly from the first. Establish clear red lines on Moscow's behavior. And when those red lines are crossed, act swiftly. Again, that starts with the current crisis over Ukraine. Ukraine needs more weapons, more advanced weapons, such as stingers, uh, and defense capabilities against air and sea attack. Washington should hit Moscow with the most effective sanctions possible against Moscow's financial system and its oligarchs if it escalates in Ukraine. And the United States should do more to, to, to expose the corruption of the Russian regime, whether that means declassifying information about Putin's wealth in the West or substantially boosting funding for Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, to get the word out to the Russian people. We should also use our contacts with Russian um, diaspora, Russian uh, opponents to make this, to get this information out within Russia. The United States should also work to exploit any friction between Russia and China, including territorial disputes, even as Putin and Xi have sought to cement a partnership in recent days. And following up on a point that Damon highlighted, our policy should impose sanctions for ongoing, additional sanctions for ongoing Russian aggression, not just in Donbass, but also in Georgia. In other words, we should seek to make current Russian levels of aggression increasingly unpalatable. The third element of our policy is practical and immediate. Work together with Moscow where possible. Even under Mr. Putin, the US and Russia have shared interests, for example, in arms control, in halting the spread of Islamic terrorism, especially in Central Asia, in containing COVID-19. There are opportunities to partner on the future of Afghanistan and the future of our planet as climate change accelerates. Such cooperation may lead to discrete gains, but also set precedents for much more cooperative relationships with Moscow in the future. The United States can pursue these shared goals while pushing back hard against Kremlin provocations. We should never sacrifice that pushback for working together on other items because that simply exacerbates the problem, the problem of the Putin threat to international order. The final element of our strategy will lay out a vision for close future relations with a prosperous Russia. This is the carrot to accompany the many United States sticks. Now is the time to start to condition the Russian government, Russian elites, and regular citizens that US intentions towards Russia are not hostile and that good relations can lead to prosperity and security for Russia as well as us, and for that matter, for the world. The United States should increase educational and cultural exchanges with Russia. The two nations can launch track 1.5 or track two diplomacy on what an alternative relationship would look like. The United States should also engage in this, Russia's quote unquote non-systemic opposition, meaning people who are not officially sanctioned by the Kremlin to be in the opposition, like Alexander Nav Alexei Navalny, and his team. We should also pull in the Russian diaspora. This strategic element also includes a stick, a stick for the current Russian regime, which at the same time is a carrot to the Russian people. We propose the bold step of freezing and holding the assets of senior Kremlin officials and their associates and Russian oligarchs in a trust fund for a return to the Russian people when a Russian government that respects the rule of law is established. We know the Russian people understand corruption is manifest at the top. This is a clear step that recognizes that and again, encourages the right policies. Current Russian policies are corruption and increasing repression at home, revisionism and coercion abroad. Again, the economy has been stagnant for a decade. It is common in Russia to hear talk of a new period of stagnation. If these policies continue, Russia's status as a great power would begin to slip. This vision we are offering is of a Russia 
where its talented citizenry, citizenry would profit from its own exertions and create a vibrant new economy. Such a Russia would naturally attract its neighbors and more distant partners by its dynamism. There would be no need to exert influence by coercion. It may seem that our policy uh, laid out here is far-fetched. Eastern Europe is now on war footing as Moscow threatens a new invasion of Ukraine. But a peaceful, prosperous Russia is a real possibility. We have seen indications in Russia today that this is well understood. You've had pushback against Moscow's threats against Ukraine from a group of Russian intellectuals. But I would say even more importantly was a statement recently issued by retired Colonel General Leonid Ivashev, a man known as a tough guy on security, a renowned patriot, heading uh, the head of the all Russia all off, excuse me, the all Russian officers assembly. In his remarkable statement, he says that Putin should not invade Ukraine, that he says correctly that Ukraine and, and NATO pose no threat to Russia. The real threats to Russia come from its internal policies. The fact that a hardliner like General Ivashev shares our vision says to me that in fact, there can be a new positive, deeply satisfying US-Russian relationship once Putin dispenses with his, his, his foreign policy revisionism and repression at home. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. There's a lot to chew on there. Uh, let me ask you one more question that I'm going to bring our panel in. Uh, so we've tried the reset. We've tried isolation. We've tried sanctioning Russia. And nothing uh, seems to work. And we seem to go back and forth on these. You've laid out a lot of different things. But uh, put aside those specifics uh, for a second. What's different about your strategy? What's different is that it puts many disparate elements together. Uh, you might say, I hope to transcend the debate between um, quote unquote Russia hawks and Russian accommodationists. I think that the accommodationists do not understand, fundamentally do not understand Russia. They think that Putin or something quote unquote worse than Putin is inevitable. I think that the Russian elite and the Russian people understand the requirements for success in today's world. And those requirements are to establish rule of law so that your people as a whole, especially the innovators as a whole, can profit from their own activities, their own exertions. Only such a system empowering the Russian people will turn Russia into a first-class economy, which would sustain great power status. I think this is understood. And uh, so we, we start with that, you may say, general uh, assumption or proposition. And from there, we go on to the need to stop Putin's aggression right now, because this is a threat to not just European security, but to global order. We can only do that by a strong policy, recognizing what Putin is up to. At the same time, uh, we cooperate where we can, which I think everyone agrees to. There's nothing new about that in our recommendations. But then the final point, which lays out again, how we can become not just um, countries that get along, but actual partners in creating a new world once Moscow gives up on aggression and establishes internal policies that meet the needs of its own people, uh, this would be truly a breakthrough. But I am confident that it'll happen because again, if Putin type policies persist, Moscow's economy will stagnate, Moscow's military strength will stagnate and nothing good will come of it for Russia or anyone else. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Okay, let's jump in. We are so privileged to have Dr. Evelyn Farkas, a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia with us. Stephen Began, the former U.S. Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary of State, and Vladimir Milov, a Russian opposition politician. Uh, Vladimir, I'd like to start with you. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. So Alexei Navalny is in prison. Many opposition leaders in Russia are abroad. And Vladimir Putin is measuring his legacy against Stalin's and Ivan the Greats. Is there any hope for domestic reform in Russia or will the world pivot to containing Russia's external threats as it did during the Soviet period? Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be part of such a distinguished panel discussing a very important document and uh, very important ideas. Uh, Navalny in prison and uh, many opposition leaders uh, either persecuted or in exile, it's not the end of story. 
And I have to say that to me, it's more a symptom of Vladimir Putin being cornered, which is why I very much value what the colleagues have to say about reaching out directly to Russian civil society, because I sense a growing understanding in the West uh, that uh, Russian people are not an enemy. They are an ally in this fight against anti-democratic authoritarian kleptocracy. Majority of Russians, there are more and more signs and mounting evidence that majority of Russians want normality. They want to live in a peaceful democracy, which is not at odds with its neighbors and the rest of the world, but which is at peace with everybody, trading with everybody, opening borders and uh, not uh, challenging the peaceful rule-based order. Russians want that. Despite all this propaganda, imperialist hype, even in Putin's environment, you can see a lot of opinion polling data, which will tell you just that, uh, that that Russians do not want confrontation. They want peace. They want prosperity. Uh, That uh, very much coincides with what John has been saying and with what colleagues have written in the paper. So I I very much uh, welcome the aspirations of many politicians, experts, commentators in the West who see reaching out directly to Russian society as uh, one more step towards uh, diminishing the dominance of uh, Putin's autocratic mafia rule, of opening a second front, if you will, finding a natural ally uh, in, in the face of the Russian people. Yes, there are those who would argue that we need to drop, I mean, Russia will never be a true democracy We need to drop this talk about uh, human rights uh, in Russia and supporting Russian civil society. We only need to talk about our security, uh, getting some guarantees from Putin that he will not uh, attack anybody. But I want to stress, uh, before the war in Georgia broke out in 2008, for several years, me and a lot of colleagues, late Boris Nemtsov and many others, we have been sending you warnings. Please do not take the story of a crackdown on human rights in Russia, of imprisonment of Khodorkovsky, whatever we had at this point. We have been saying, do not take it as an internal Russian issue. When Putin tastes blood, when he feels this taste of lawlessness, he will move on to export this lawless behavior to the international stage. He will not stop at home. Violation of human rights is not an internal thing. It is an early sign that the autocracy is developing an appetite for aggressive behavior, disregard of the rules. Later, a few years down the road, this behavior began to be exported and Russia became an international problem. So it's very important that uh, many more uh, people by the day are understanding in the West that they shouldn't drop uh, human rights off the agenda, should not ignore it, should not try just to resolve their own security issues. It's all connected. One goes with the other. And here's also the opportunity because liberation of Russia, reaching out directly to the Russian people, will greatly advance uh, our common cause, building a peaceful rule-based international order, which will bring prosperity to everyone. Super, thanks so much. And we're so glad to have you here with us, uh, Vladimir. Uh, Evelyn, you recently staked out a hardline position on Ukraine. John has said that Ukraine is the the important point that we're all watching now for obvious reasons. Should President Biden put boots on the ground in Ukraine? And you're muted, Evelyn. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, The report is so timely and so well done. Um, I think it it really does a service for the U.S. government, um, and maybe they don't have to do their own national security strategy for Russia now. Um, I want to just so underline some of the points that um, Vladimir made, and I'm very honored to appear with him again. Um, I love his points about, you know, human rights don't end. If they're being violated in Moscow, eventually they'll be violated elsewhere. And My point in a piece I wrote for Defense One, which has been a a little bit mischaracterized because they gave it a headline that sounded like I was advocating for war with Russia, direct war with Russia, which is not the case. So I do not, just to answer your question, advocate for uh, American troops on the front line fighting directly um, with Ukraine against Russia. What I advocate is indirect 
war, meaning we support the Ukrainians as we have done since 2014 and ramp it up as the Biden administration has done. But my overall point is, you know, it's, it's, it's again, repeating what many other colleagues have said so many times, but in this, you know, um, weird, busy media world, you have to constantly repeat things that sometimes seem obvious, like civis pasam para bellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. That's what deterrence is all about. You have to scare the other guy into thinking if he moves militarily against you, he will receive a response that will be painful for him. And again, just to echo what Vladimir just said, um, if we don't have a response, an adequate and strong response of Vladimir Putin in the context of Ukraine, and by defining strong, I don't mean necessarily military. Uh, you know, there are many ways to address the situation that we're in right now. The military deterrence is just one part of it. And maybe at the end of the day, it won't be the thing that actually unlocks the, the, the puzzle and allows us to, you know, come down from this heightened state of alert because of the crisis that Vladimir Putin has put us into. But my main point is that if we don't stand up right now for Ukraine, we will not be, we will then be essentially surrendering not just Ukraine, but the security of Europe. And as Damon said, the international order. I mean, there's, there's nothing less than that at stake here. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Evelyn. You got to watch those editors. They always love to write uh, inflammatory <laughs> titles. Uh, it's the oldest trick in the book. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's, it's great to see you. You were the deputy, uh, deputy secretary of state in the much maligned Trump presidency. And despite some peculiarities in Russia policy, things were pretty quiet on your watch. What changed? Well, thank you, Melinda. Let me start by uh, uh, thanking the other uh, commentators, uh, excellent remarks, but especially John and his team for putting together a great report. John, uh, I, what I especially like about your report is the uh, the way you break it into four different uh, areas of priority, and you don't do it sequentially. We have to we have to do these simultaneously. Of course, in your fourth area, where we're talking about a better future for U.S. Russian relations, it's hard to envision. Uh, certainly, it, it would be impossible to execute at this point, but the conversation itself should continue. A lot of great uh, food for thought in the report, uh, most of which I fully agree with, and uh, and thank you for this contribution uh, to the current debate. You know, to answer your question, Melinda, uh, first I have to be uh, I have to be fair to the current administration that we didn't face anything of these of the magnitude of what what they're facing right now, at least in the case of the Russian Federation. And so, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be fair for me to compare their response uh, to, to anything that, uh, that the previous administration did by virtue of the fact that the circumstances have changed so dramatically. But um, you know, in the, in the broader US-Russian relationship for which I did take a significant amount of responsibility in the administration, uh, we did test some of the concepts that were included in, in, uh, in the, uh, that are included in the Atlantic Council paper. And I think I, I could say on balance, some of them paid dividends, although some of them uh, were abject failures. So, for example, uh, my first position in the administration was actually as the lead envoy for North Korea. I had an excellent and very cooperative relationship with my counterpart, Deputy Foreign Minister uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We worked very closely together. Um, we uh, we shared uh, information. We collaborated where possible, where, where we needed to disagree. We would explain uh, respectfully uh, why we felt a different approach was necessary. We sustained cooperation uh, for uh, nearly two and a half years on North Korea policy very successfully. And it probably was one of the highlights in, in, the, in, the, in the category of, of the Atlanta Council paper of working together on where our interests may align. We had uh, less success in Afghanistan, but uh, my uh, counterpart, the Special Envoy for Afghanistan, did maintain as well close, rela uh, close contact with his uh, Russian counterpart. Uh, and uh, and it reflected a shared concern about Afghanistan rather than a shared approach to Afghanistan. But nonetheless, I think it paid some dividends over the course of, of the administration. Um, we uh, we cooperated, uh, particularly the United States cooperated with Russia during the uh, uh, early wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we actually shipped ventilators uh, to the Russian people from the uh, surplus that the United States quickly developed. And while this wasn't universally welcomed, it was an important sign of what Vladimir Milov was describing, which is the very importance of, of soft power and contact with the Russian people. And I think on balance, it was beneficial uh, to the United States interest 
to show that level of generosity with the Russian Federation. Certainly, there was nothing to be gained from uh, from uh, failing to help Russia in, in the midst of such a terrible pandemic. And lastly, uh, we tried but were unsuccessful in renegotiating the uh, New START agreement. Our goal was to uh, to add some add some content to it, to a suspension of the of uh, uh, production of warheads. We simply ran out of time. We you know probably started too late. And while there was some early Russian interest in discussing the issues that we had tabled, um, in the end, the Biden administration uh, had to inherit a, a, a arms control treaty with just a few weeks left in its life and made it its own decision on the extension for a five-year period. Some areas uh, that we engaged closely with the Russians and in, in, uh, in I would say saw absolutely no success include Belarus, where early on in the conflict, uh, I was sent by the Secretary of State to meet with uh, Svetlana Sikonuskaya. Uh, she was by then in Vilnius, just a few weeks after the election was stolen by Lukashenko. But I made my next stop, uh, Moscow, to have a, a candid discussion with the Russians that it would be a mistake for this to be a reprise of, of uh, what happened in Ukraine. I have to say that uh, I was never overly optimistic that that would produce uh, a positive outcome. It was at least initially some dimensions of constructive discussion where we we discussed the, the fact that the Belarusian people left to freely choose their own leader would not necessarily and very unlikely even uh, pick a hostile uh, relationship with Russia as part of their leadership selection. Uh, I was told off the record by uh, one official that uh, in practice, the outcome we were describing uh, could probably work, but in principle, it was completely unacceptable to the Kremlin. The notion of allowing people to choose their own leader was simply hitting too close to home, and it was a fruitless effort. And in fact, in many of these discussions, I also have to say that our discussions at the Department of State were with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but in very few cases was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs actually the responsible author for the policies that we were undertaking. The other areas of, of deep discord were the Navalny poisoning, um, where, uh, quite frankly, our Russian interlocutors had no answer. Uh, in, in, in you know, the reflexive defense against it eventually became uh, the talking point. But initially, I think even even uh, many Russian officials were appalled at the uh, at the uh, the brutal overreach of trying to poison uh, Russia's leading opposition figure. And, and of course, the election interference. I wouldn't say we necessarily had success, although we did challenge the Russians very directly in a very high level. We didn't have enormous success in persuading them. Uh, to, to stay out of our elections, but we did have significant success in 2020 in keeping them out of our elections. And that too is something that I'm quite proud of. So we did have a way to engage with the, with the Russian government and Russian counterparts. And, I, and I, I think it was very important. And this is why I go back to the Atlanta Council report that these, these, these recommendations should not be viewed sequentially because we do have to walk and chew gum at the same time. I do not believe the total isolation of either the Russian government or the Russian society benefits us. We, of course, have to do the things that are mentioned early in the report. We have to take a very, very tough line on deterring misbehavior, and we have to be very clear on what we find unacceptable uh, in the conduct of, of Moscow in, uh, in, in uh, geopolitics. But at the same time, uh, it's also my view that if we don't engage with the Russian government, we actually provide more room for maneuver for the regime than we do for ourselves. I understand the value of, of isolating them on principle. But I have to say my experience as deputy secretary was we could at least get a little bit further inside of their thinking through engagement. But that's not the most important form of engagement right now. That's a necessity in my view in certain areas. But the most important is the one that, that uh, has been mentioned several times today, which was engagement with the Russian people themselves. You know, I've long been, uh, 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 I've long had a view that uh, the United States policy should be based around a very simple construct. Don't give in to Putin. Don't give up on Russia. And I've tried to live by that uh, through, uh, through the many years of challenging uh, policy dilemmas with the Russian Federation. Unfortunately, that too is not so easy. I did a, uh, in preparation for today's remarks, I did a quick count of how many organizations that I've either worked for or been a board member of that have been expelled from Russia that operate in the people to people space the National Endowment for Democracy, the International Republican Institute, the Moscow School of Political Studies, the U.S.-Russia Foundation for Economic Development and the Rule of Law, the Freedom House. All of these are organizations which used to have cooperative relationships with Russians, with the Russian people who sought to work together to advance the, the, uh, 
the quality of life and the, and the uh, rule of law in, in the Russian Federation, and all of them have been expelled. Um, and this too is an area that uh, when I was in government, we spoke with directly with the Russian government, that if, if the choice of the Russian government is to completely eliminate all space for dialogue between societies, then we're going to have to overemphasize on, on the, those means which we control. And I, I do think we need to do that. Uh, we need to bolster our information efforts. We need to find ways to reach Russian people, uh, if, if not inside Russia, then outside Russia. It's simply unacceptable, but it is, a, it is a, 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 an overt policy of the Kremlin to isolate its own civil society from contact uh, with uh, outside parties, particularly the West. And so uh, I strongly advocate uh, that people to people uh, effort, but I also would not underestimate the challenges uh, that it will present to us. Super, thank you so much, Steve. You gave us so much to chew over. I was thinking about Bard College as you were going through the list as well. It's it's almost impossible uh, to have those people to people ties. Is the only solution basically to, for Americans and Russian citizens to be in third party countries to do this kind of work now? Or is well, there uh, another creative way to get around that? That was a workaround for a while, Melinda, but uh, the Russian government has revised the undesirable foreign organizations law to criminalize that kind of interaction outside the Russian borders as well. So it comes at some risk to our, our Russian friends. Um, you know, Russia is is not a monolithic nation. There's there's uh, uh, you know a, a wide variety of views, and we've seen some of those expressed has been discussed here today uh, in terms of um, in terms of uh, opposition to the aggression in Ukraine. What I'd say is we have to. We have, we have to find different ways to speak to the Russian people. We can do that through, um, through third, part, third country contact for sure. It shouldn't be, we shouldn't, we shouldn't slink around and do that. It should be as something that we do as, as, a, uh, as an open matter, uh, you know, working closely with Damon at the National Endowment for Democracy. We do seek to continue to provide support for Russians seeking to advocate for democracy. And I think that's successful. I think we have to use our information tools too, though much more effectively. And here uh, it includes the clarity of the messages from our own government. Uh, and, and I would hope that we can have a unified US government position around this, uh, but also uh, it, 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 uh, it's gonna require us to use uh, information tools like RFERL, but not surprisingly, they're under a, a huge pressure. And you mentioned Bard College, is the, uh, the blasphemous banning of Memorial. I mean, it's just such a travesty that Memorial an organization, a proud organization that is truly at heart serving the Russian people has been found to be a foreign agent in Russia is just, is just frankly pathetic. I couldn't agree with you more. Evelyn, let's bring you back into this. So the Biden administration has gone farther than any other in declassifying intelligence. And I'm talking about the, the threat uh, around Ukraine again. Was that the right thing to do? And is there any downside to declassifying this intelligence? And should we have done this before? Well, so Melinda, the, the, the damage, the, the risk of course is as an intelligence community that you give away how you you know, how you got garnered the information, right? So that's the risk. And um, in the in the first um, kind of go at this, if you will, the same people, the people that I worked with in the Obama administration are now running the response and hopefully now more proactive effort um, now in the Biden administration. The we we went through a lot of discussion about declassifying information or reclassifying information, um, recategorizing information, even so we could share it with our NATO allies. And um, General Breedlove had to go and you know on the open market and find some um, uh, signal, not signals, but um, imagery that he could share with allies and with Ukrainians. So we made our lives more difficult in terms of you know winning the public relations or the public outreach effort and 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 so russia was able to conduct all kinds of crazy disinformation on everything from you know who shot down the mh17 we all know it was the russian russian uh, russian military officers working with russian supported separatists in ukraine with russian equipment but they had a whole bunch of cockamamie, you know, contradictory, uh, you know, um, psy psyop information, which was just a pack of lies around that time. 
um, and many other examples of Russian obfuscation that we we didn't push back against. I mean, one of the differences, of course, is also that the Russian government has undertaken this military operation, this buildup on the border of Ukraine, and then in Bel- well, first in the north and the east and uh, south, and then and then coming from Belarus, and it's been done very publicly. So that did make it probably a little bit easier for us in the early days. And since then, it seems like the administration has gotten the right balance of sharing information and obviously having to, you know, um, keep, keep, keep track, keep safe those, those sources and methods. So I do think that it's a good thing. And I do think that our allies, our partners, the Ukrainians, and, you know, the public deserves to understand better what's going on behind the scenes. Super. I have two more questions on Ukraine, since this is a big theme of the paper, and then I'm going to open it up, and I'd love to have more questions from our audience. I have a question for John Herbst and then Vladimir Milov. Uh, John, so everyone is saying that the allies are on the same page when it comes to Ukraine and Russia's aggression, but Macron uh, is in Kiev today. He was in Moscow yesterday, and he seems to be doing some shuttle diplomacy, and Boris Johnson is sending more supplies, and the Germans are being Germans. Are we really all on the same page? Uh, I think it's safe to say that rarely is the U.S. and all the allies on the same page, going back throughout the history of the NATO alliance. But often we're in this, we're almost always in the same room, and we're usually pulling in the same direction, albeit with different levels of strength and willingness to take risk. Uh, the Biden administration, to its credit, understands that NATO is important and that we have to lead within NATO. And also that cooperation with the EU is important. We have to find ways to do that. But I think they're not sufficiently strong as leaders. I think when sometimes when they hear no, or maybe from the allies, they need to push harder. Um, Strong leadership, as I said in my opening remarks, requires that we not cater to the weaknesses of our allies and partners, that we pull them by our own strength. So that, and you see that in this current Ukraine crisis. I think that the most resolute member of the alliance, uh, at least among the major powers in the alliance, have been the Brits. I think Biden has done pretty well, but I think the Brits have been stronger. Um, the Brits have been out ahead of us in providing weapons to Ukraine, recognizing the limitations they have that we do not. Also in demonstrating NATO presence in the Black Sea. You had the the Brits famously sending their destroyer into the Black Sea last spring when the U.S. decided not to, which was not a a good step by the administration. Uh, So, again, I think Biden's doing a pretty good job pulling the allies along, although one issue where I think he has not done as well is on Nord Stream 2. Although finally he spoke without equivocation literally just this week when Schultz was weak on Nord Stream 2, uh, Biden said, no, if Russia sends those troops into Ukraine, Nord Stream 2 is kaput. Now, of course, Nord Stream 2 should be kaput even without those Russian troops going into Ukraine. But given the current crisis, that's not bad at all. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, Vladimir, I, I, we have spent the last three months arguing about Vladimir Putin and what he's going to do in Ukraine. So we would love to have your view. What are the factors that constrain Putin or that hold him back from going all in on Ukraine? Well, uh, first, I do not personally think that uh, he's going to invade right now. I think what he's doing is a very, very crafted bluff uh, targeted at dividing Western allies, actually testing your response. Uh, If he really goes one day all in, uh, what will be different measures uh, in response? They they want this information to analyze it. But, uh, you know, as John uh, answered one of the questions, what's the value of this strategy paper? It's combining different elements. I think there is no magic silver bullet. Uh, there There is no magic key which you would turn and then Putin will stop from... His aggression, I think uh, he should see a lot of damage inflicted on him on many fronts. Uh, Tough military response. And I think in this regard, it's also important to talk about supporting the morale of Ukrainians, uh, because I feel that many of them are are feeling that they're left alone in this fight, that they're betrayed by many politicians in the West. 
I think a much stronger solidarity with Ukraine uh, from uh, the point of democratic international community will be very helpful. We're not only talking weapons here, we're talking much, much uh, stronger moral support and encouraging them to fight and resist the aggression. I also think it's, once again, we're coming back to the importance of talking to the Russian people, explaining to them the situation, because uh, there was a very uh, one of the very unfortunate recent polls, which says that um, only a single digit percentage points of the Russian population blame this crisis on Putin's government. Majority of them are either com- confused or tend to blame it on the West. So we need, we all need to do more to explain uh, where are the roots of this crisis and who is guilty. And uh, Putin might suffer also a lot of damage uh, domestically, economically, which will take a heavy toll on his popularity and might help bring his uh, government, his regime to an end. So I think in, in this regard, I heard uh, from my former colleagues in the Russian government you saw probably the media reports that they conducted stress tests for big state companies and banks, how they will withstand and survive the Western sanctions. Actually, the results are not good. Some media reported them to be nearly catastrophic. So it is important for Vladimir Putin to understand the economic damage that uh, uh, actually a very weak Russian economy will suffer from uh, such a major effort as all out war. So it's all of the above. We should not we should not emphasize one single factor, but uh, we should try to use all the instruments possible to prevent such aggression from happening. I don't think, again, I don't think it's very likely at this point, but he will be encouraged if we are weak and do not respond to this uh, military troop buildup. Got it. Say more, though, for us. Uh, how can the U.S. government use its resources uh, to speak directly to the Russian people, given all the constraints uh, that Steve put out? You know, we have RFERL. They're under huge pressure. We have Voice of America also under a lot of pressure. Uh, state media is expensive and it's really hard to get into. Uh, give us some advice. What would you do if, if you were thinking if you were advising uh, Steve at the State Department? What, would, what advice would you give him? First, I want to encourage you because there's great demand for alternative point of view in Russia. I love to show this Levada graph, uh, which shows that uh, eight years ago, before the war against Ukraine started, over 90% of Russians were using TV, state TV as a major source of information. That's only 60 now, compared to uh, about 40% uh, with the internet which have risen like phoenix from flames to really compete with the state TV. So there's great demand, and uh, you can use all channels. Uh, You can use uh, Radio Liberty, you can use Voice of America, but you can use also a a brilliant new independent media and investigative journalists, which have emerged in Russia in the past years. Many of them have been labeled foreign agents, and many of them are also in exile now, but they want to continue broadcasting, and there is a demand for it. Same thing about us, politicians, uh, like Navalny Live Channel has a combined monthly audience over 10 million people. That's comparable to the Channel One of the Russian television. So if you do support the you know, grassroots broadcasting from uh, independent civil society members, journalists, investigators, and uh, politicians who are currently in exile, we are all committed to continue broadcasting and having this people-to-people communication, uh, that is one thing that you can also support apart from the state media. So again, it's all of the above sort of thing, which altogether might produce a very strong uh, information messaging that will open the eyes of the people uh, and uh, tell them the truth. Got it. Say more about YouTube. I know there's a cat and mouse game with YouTube. Opposition politicians in Russia are using YouTube to speak to many, many people. Uh, is the the Russian are the Russian authorities cracking down on YouTube? How close are they to cracking down on the platform? Uh, Putin wants to shut down YouTube badly, uh, but there is a problem uh, because YouTube isn't. Uh, I think he overslept it and let it go too far. YouTube is an extremely popular platform for dozens of millions of ordinary Russians, many of them absolutely apolitical. Uh, They watch it for entertainment purposes, uh, mommies showing cartoons to their kids, or like, you know, even I did this thing recently. I lost the key 
and I was typing, I was searching on YouTube a video, like 25 million views on Russian YouTube. How do you open the door with, without a key, right? So that sort of stuff. Uh, you will have dozens of millions of uh, non-political people very angry and very disappointed if Putin shuts down this platform. And YouTube, uh, and uh, uh, I have to uh, pay respects to them, they have been refusing to take down individual opposition channels or videos. So they clearly lay out a prospect like either you shut us down completely, which is politically very costly for Putin, or we continue running without censoring uh, our political content. So that's a huge political dilemma for Putin. It's a double-edged sword, which is why with all the talk about shutting down YouTube, he hasn't moved for it yet, and uh, I'm sure it will be problematic for him to do so. Super. So thank God for those cat videos that everyone wants to watch. They're they're protecting you guys. Uh, oh. Steve, I know. Uh, Steve and Evelyn, before I bring in our audience, I have one question for you guys. Did John leave anything out? You're looking at, at this report. You guys have both said at DOD and at state. Uh, what, what's missing, if anything? Evelyn, do, do you see anything obvious that should have gone in there or that you would put you know, in bold or in italics? I mean, the only thing that maybe I would spend a little more time on would be rallying the global community to draw attention to the perf perfidy the perfidious nature of the current government in Russia. Um, what do I mean by that? You know, go do what our ambassador did. Go to the United Nations regularly. Try to pass resolutions through, through the General Assembly condemning R Russia, not just for what they're doing with their forces, but the human rights violations in Russia and the and, and also outside of Russia, the extraterritorial killings, you know, the whole host of international crimes that have been conducted by this government. And I would make it so that leaders in Africa who have maybe Russians showing up, offering them things that are very enticing, have another picture, that they have a context that, oh, there might be some problem, I might suffer, you know, some, some kind of diplomatic condemnation, or my reputation might suffer, or my people might look down on me for taking assistance from this government. So, again, it's not the thing that's going to, you know, cause us to finally get rid of that horrible regime, you know, as Vladimir said, it's many things, but that would be one thing that maybe I would spend a little more time on, the global diplomatic campaign. Super, that's, that's a great suggestion. How about you, Steve? I certainly uh, agree with uh, everything Evelyn said. I'd complement that by a similar efforts domestically. I think uh, thought leaders and, and policy experts and political leaders, especially above all, uh, uh, need to need to do more work to lay out the stakes and lay out the case and to build a sense of national unity. Because if there's anything that's going to deter uh, the regime in, in the Kremlin from invading Ukraine, or maybe said the other way, if there's anything that's gonna invite them to, it's a sense that there's a deep division inside Western societies that they can exploit. So I think that's one. A second uh, is that I think uh, leaders have to level with their populations as part of that, that there will be costs associated with standing up to this. Um, it will uh, do us no good if we get the German chancellor supportive of us to a certain extent, and then he loses the German people. Um, that that uh, can be addressed by uh, full candor, not to undermine the position or leadership of Western leaders, but to prepare the publics for what may be to come. That too, I think, is an effective complement to the deterrent. And one that's uh, slightly uh, uh, off those uh, recommendations is building capacity here in the United States of America uh, uh, for better understanding of Russian affairs, for, for better engagement with Russia. We need to promote uh, uh, wherever possible more education programs, exchange programs, area study, studies programs. We allowed Russian studies in the United States to atrophy in the years, in the decades since 1991. All of us are, are uh, specialists or have lived, uh, lived in Russia or are Russian in the case of Vladimir, um, but uh, we're losing that capacity and we, we need to re-energize our own society. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, Steve. When I was at Georgetown in 2010, I had to beg to study Russian. Uh, it, it, it was really, really bad. So I, I couldn't agree with you more about uh, boosting the, those, uh, 
the Russian and Eurasia study programs across the country. Okay, you can go ahead and uh, unmute John, Steve, you're, you're unmuted, Evelyn, you're unmuted, Vladimir, uh, you can unmute. We have 10 minutes and lots of questions. And this is the fun part. I'm gonna ask you a question and you get two, maybe three sentences. Uh, so here we go, we call this blitz round. John, John is an old hand at this. Uh, we wanna get through as many questions as we can. So first question, John, this is to you from Dr. Harlan Ullman. He says, as you know, every major Russian military exercise finishes with a nuclear scenario. It would appear, however, that the West would be surprised if this repeats. Why is that? And what should our response if Putin extends the exercise, which he may uh, well do? Look, um, the first instance right now is you have to make sure that Moscow, do all we can to make sure Moscow does not send those troops into Ukraine. But secondly, we have once we get past this crisis, we have to map out a plan of action to uh, penalize Moscow, maybe with sanctions, maybe some other way for the provocation, not just aggression. Great, super. Uh, Vladimir, I have a question for you from a gentleman named Lou. He says, uh, tell me more about the Russian Orthodox Church and the possibility of war with Ukraine. What is the attitude of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, in Ukraine uh, towards the war? Uh, it's really not too relevant because the church is not too popular with the Russian population. Like many factors, the at attendance of churches on holidays like Christmas or Easter is just a single digit percentage points of the population. According to many polls like Pew Research, less than 20% of the Russians uh, say that religion plays an important role in, in uh, their lives. And church have not been too vocal on this uh, standoff. As a matter of fact, Russian propaganda, including the church, downplay Russian government's involvement in uh, what's going on. So uh, the church is sticking it head, its head down and uh, uh, not commenting too much. I don't think it will have a lot of say if uh, anything happens. That's interesting. It wasn't like that in 2014. Uh, they played a, a more outspoken role. That's really interesting. Okay, Evelyn, question for you. You get a good one from Larry. Does Russia think its collaboration with China will be a better path for it than looking to Europe and the U.S.? Well, clearly right now they do, but I suspect if you talk to Russian strategists and especially military leaders, they will have a different perspective. Um, they understand that in the long run, they have to keep an eye on China. It is growing its nuclear arsenal. It is growing its conventional forces. We all, You already have seen Chinese moving into Russian territory, buying real estate. So um, it's right now, it's very tactical and advantageous for Vladimir Putin. For the Russian people and the Russian state, there's a big open question about the future relationship with China. Super, thank you. Steve, question for you from Jack. And he wants to question you about uh, the panacea of social media. He says, haven't all of the authoritarians already wised up to social media to the extent that they can both monitor usage and use it themselves to combat external media sources? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I don't think there is a panacea in social media uh, in and of itself, but I think it's part of a broader uh, set of solutions that we have to bring to the information space. You know, we, um, in the late 1990s, we stood down the United States Information Agency and operated under the assumption that the free flow of information will actually aid uh, the spread of democratic ideals around the world. That's proven to be terribly wrong, and we need to do a lot of work on social media at home and abroad. Super, thank you. John Herbst, from, another one from Jack. Can your strategy work without the enthusiastic support of France and Germany, or can it be a U.S.-U.K. only approach? Um, I don't have any doubt that if the U.S. threw itself fully into this and pulled in the U.K., and I suspect other NATO allies, maybe not all of them, it can be a successful approach. And again, I repeat, when the United States sets its head on something uh, and it's a sensible idea, we're able to pull along most of the allies. Okay, super. Uh, Vladimir, this is to you. Uh, it's from Barry Welch, and he says, since Putin controls the media in Russia, must we use more aggressive information dissemination vis-a-vis uh, -vis hacking to inject alternative views? I think, again, I would repeat, uh, the problem is very simple. Uh, Putin is losing it uh, with control of the information space. His propaganda is becoming less and less popular by the day. People feel that there is something wrong with it. Russian people who are not really educated uh, on political topics still understand that something is wrong and are looking for alternative. So we need to capture that demand. We need to offer them 
a picture of normality versus Putin's propaganda. We don't need to hack anything. We just need to tell them the truth. Super. Okay, got it. Uh, Evelyn, this is from Christian, and he wants to know, does it seem realistic after Vladimir Putin made such a big deal with his military buildup that he will just back down without getting anything he demanded? At the moment, no, which is why I fear some kind of military operation against Ukraine. And so I guess that's the short answer. <laughs> okay, short, short and sweet. That's the shortest one for you. Okay, super, super. I want to give John, uh, Steve, Vladimir, and Evelyn uh, one last swipe. We have uh, about two minutes remaining. Is there anything else that you'd like to add in conclusion? I'll start. I'll start. I'm going to give John the the, la the last last conclusion. Uh, Steve, you're a brave man. I'm going to give you the first go at this. I'm just going to repeat what I said. Don't give in to Putin. Don't give up on Russia. I'm going to. I'm going to embroider that on a pillow. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. I think, you know, emphasizing how we can help the Russian people, uh, how average Americans can help the Russian people. Can we contribute to Maria Logan's organization? How do we help dissidents? Um, there are people who care fervently and who would go fund something. Um, I understand all that could potentially cause trouble for our Russian friends, but how do we do that more effectively? Super. Vladimir, before you give us your last concluding comment, uh, we got a good question. Can anyone comment on the on Colonel General uh, Ivash's statement that John mentioned? Yeah, uh, he's not, uh, Ivashov is not too influential, uh, so is this group of uh, retired officers, but this reflects the general mood of the army. The army does not want to go to war for no reason, and my last point would be, when this crisis is over, if Putin pulls troops uh, away from the Ukrainian border, it doesn't mean that the threat will go away. It will be coming back around uh, very soon, which is why we need strategic approach, which is why it's very good that we're discussing this paper today. Super. Thank you very much. John Herbst, the last word is yours. Okay. I would encapsulate my policy strategy in the following statement. Ask not what Putin can do to us ask what we can do to Putin and for the Russian people. You heard it here at the Atlantic Council. Thank you so much for the opportunity to spend the afternoon with you. Congratulations to Ambassador John Herbst and his colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Evelyn Farkas, Vladimir Milov, and Stephen Beacon. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Thank you and a wonderful evening in Moscow. Bye-bye. Thank you.